a video from the Gardner Symposium last week that we heard is really really good. It's Clayton Christensen, and he's a Harvard professor at IT, and he's going to speak on innovation on that keynote. We're next door from Gardner, so Gardner was kind enough to provide that. That is really good. It is? Yeah, great. So anyway, it's a full hour long, so we're not going to do introductions to the video next time, so just go ahead and help yourself in and out of that room when you're scheduled to be in that room. And uh, it's my pleasure to go ahead and kick off this session. I'm going to uh, do the speaker bios. We have uh, Justin Stoffel. Uh, Justin is a computer programmer whose wide range of technical interests have converged on 3D printing and personal fabrication. Justin is fascinated and driven by the notion that computers aren't limited to outputting pixels on a screen. They can instead produce physical, useful objects. As a believer in the power of community-oriented technology, Justin believes the future of personal fabrication could be a second industrial revolution in a post-industrial age. We also have Rob Geisberg. Rob. Rob. Uh, Rob's a self-taught software engineer by day and an aspiring electrical engineer that is helping to advance personal CNC and 3D printing technologies in his spare time. And Craig Bershite, is that correct? Uh, Craig graduated from KU with a BS in computer engineering and has been working in embedded systems development in Kansas City ever since. Um, he's active in the local maker community, especially the local hackerspace. Um, which is part of Cowtown Computer Congress of Kansas City, a.k.a. Kansas City Hackerspace. And his primary field of interest is DIY CNC systems. He's recently founded a small startup offering design and manufacturing services with a number of products manufactured on demand. And we also have three other uh, members of the team here with us today. Louis Rodriguez, Tim Middleton, and Michael Overstreet. Way in the back there. So, <laughs> these guys are here to answer any questions that we might have on. So. Yeah, that's we're going to stop talking. We're going to be doing some demos, maybe passing around some of, the, some of our wares to kind of kind of show what you have here. Fantastic. But uh, I suppose I should get started. And my, my bio sure sounded pretentious having it ready now. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> write that long, Justin. That's <laughs> <why>. <laughs> Oops. All right. And I'm really close. Yes, yeah. Um, anyways, uh, let's see. Okay, uh, go ahead. I'm going to start off talking about hackerspaces because the story kind of starts off with hackerspaces. We always get asked about it because it's kind of a weird word. Um, but then I figured I'd better cover it first. So, hackerspaces are local groups of hobbyists, amateurs, tinkerers, ele electrical engineers, artists who kind of band together to share tools, workspaces, and ideas. More than anything else, collaboration is what we do. You can kind of see a map here of uh, all the hackerspaces around the world. There are a lot of them. And I'll say most of the ones over in this section, anyways, didn't start up till somewhere around 2008. So this is a, a relatively new thing that's popular, in, you know, especially in larger cities and, and things. Uh, there's a group photo of us down in our hackerspace, our, our old location. Uh, that was taken around Christmas time, maybe a little after. Um, so you can go ahead to the, the next slide. Um, so what we're really here to talk about is personal fabrication. Um, personal fabrication is, is a term coined by MIT professor Neil Gershenfeld. He's also known as the, the founder of the Center for Bits and Atoms at MIT, and he's the guy, if you've ever heard of the class, How to Build Almost Anything, he's the guy who started that class and teaches that class. Uh, and that's kind of the, the real idea behind personal fabrication, is that there's, is making products that are industrial quality, manufacturing quality, but making them on a personal level, either, either for yourself or either the small batches, that sort of thing, with your own machines like some of the machines we have here. So in short, it basically means the ability to make your own stuff rather than have to go to the store and buy it, whereas mass manufactured in a big factory over in China or something. Um, go ahead and move to the next one. So what are the tools of personal fabrication? Um, I would say the tools of personal fabrication are anything that, that can take a digital design and turn it into a real world object. So this includes CNC machines, 3D printers, laser cutters, uh, paper cutters, like the kind you see on display at Hobby Lobby, uh, embroidery machines, anything that takes a digital design and turns it into a real thing. Um, you know, and, and including with some of like the, the CNC routers, like the ones you see here. Also keep in mind, these things can mill PCBs, so you can uh, make your own circuit boards uh, for electronics design, things like that. 
So you really can make your own stuff. It's not just bits of plastic. Um, so um, what are some of the things that enabled personal fabrication to come into existence? Why is this something we just have now? We've had CNC machines and 3D printers and laser cutters out in industry for decades. You know, these are things that have only been available in prototyping labs and in factories. Uh, basically, a few things have, have happened that have made them easier to use for at, at, at the personal level. Uh, the number one thing I kind of recognize, at least for me personally, is the Arduino. The Arduino is an open source microcontroller platform. We have a couple variations of Arduinos around here that I pass around. Um, it's, the, the real hook with this one is that it's easy to program. An amateur or someone completely non-technical and inexperienced can sit down with one of these things and start programming it within an hour. You don't need any physical hardware programmer to program it. You just need some open source software that runs cross-platform in any operating system and about a $30 investment in a board that looks like that. What else you do to it and what else you add on to it, that, that's at your own discretion. But you can get started in under an hour, I assure you, with no programming or electronics experience before. So it's kind of opened the door for people who have never been into this sort of thing to start getting into electronics and prototyping. Um, the, the next thing I kind of recognize uh, as, as moving personal fabrication forward was the Rip Wrap project. Uh, I have a Rip Wrap over here. Actually, this is mine. It's out of commission at the moment. Um, what it is, is a self-replicating rapid prototyper. This comes from a university project at the University of Bath in the UK, started by Dr. Adrian Boyer. Uh, what he did is he wanted to come up with a rapid, proto rapid prototyper that can self-replicate. So in other words, it can print its own parts. All these parts you see that hold all these bracket, or these uh, threaded rods together, those were printed on a machine just like this. In fact, it was printed on a machine more like this. One of our shared tools we had down in the hacker space. Um, so the idea is that it extrudes plastic out, builds it up layer by layer, and can print lots of stuff, including its own parts. So if I have a riprap, I can print someone else a riprap. We can print someone else a riprap. And the end result of this is a lot of people nowadays have riprap's. <laughs> They're kind of all over the place. Um, in addition, there's also been some riprap derivatives, which we'll cover later. Um, and kind of the third important factor that uh, I recognize anyways is making personal fabrication possible is the hackerspace maker movement. I mean, for years, there's people like us hanging out in our own basements alone, never talking to anybody, doing this sort of thing anyways. All of a sudden, people started getting together and doing it together, and that really, really pushed things along. Uh, you know, we all met down at the hackerspace. We all got together because of these common interests here, and we wouldn't be where we're at today if we didn't do so. Um, it also, there's, there's much more of an attitude about a maker movement going on. You know, I'm wearing a Maker Fair t-shirt here. Uh, you might have been to Maker Fair in, at Union Station uh, last June, and we have another one this June, the 23rd and 24th, down at Union Station. Highly recommend you attend. Um, but people have started taking more interest in the idea of making your own things. So, for example, Radio Shack a couple years ago was taking all their electronic components out of their stores, or at least pushing them to the back of the stores and just bringing in booth after booth of cell phones. Um, they did a survey on, on their website back in May of this year asking customers, what do you want to see stocked in our store? The number one answer was the Arduino. They want to see microcontrollers. They want to see more things to make stuff. Um, make Magazine has gotten very popular in the last couple of years. Hacker Spaces, as I showed you on the map before, started popping up just since 2008. There's been a resurgence of people wanting to make stuff, and therefore there's more of a demand for this, and there's more people working on personal fabrication. So. Uh, one thing I see that personal fabrication is going to bring in the future is the idea of open source hardware. Uh, we've all heard of open source software. We probably all use it and rely on it in some aspect. Um, and in my opinion, the reason that open source software exists is one, people can collaborate over the internet, and two, people have access to the compilers and runtime platforms that open source software runs on. If you didn't have access to it, if, if say a compiler cost $1,000, $2,000, no one would have them. You know, not many people, hobbyists, would, would be sitting around in their spare time writing code because they wouldn't be able to compile it. They wouldn't be able to send it to a friend across the world to see what they can do. So having cheap compilers or free compilers like we have was an enabling factor for open source software. Now if everyone has some sort of personal fabrication device in their house, it opens up the possibility for collaboratively designed hardware. So that's why I have a little tagline there, CNC is the new compiler. You can make it, if you can 
download a digital design and then have that object in your house an hour later, you can do open source hardware. And in fact, uh, the rib rack, the maker box we have up here, the Arduino itself, all of that is open source hardware. So you can actually download the designs. Um, so the, the, there's some of my last slide right here, but uh, I just wanted to, to bring up a point that amateurs like ourselves tend to start revolutions, not to get you know, too pretentious again like my introduction, but uh, if you go back to say the 1930s, you can find groups of amateur rocket makers building rockets in small groups uh, and comparing notes and building these things, and that's what our space program was based on. It was the same guys who were doing that that sent you know, and put a man on the moon 40 years later. You go to the 1970s, uh, we've had computers around for a couple decades at this point, but it was not something you could have in your own home. But there are people that were buying chips, soldering them onto boards, and putting together their own computers, and meeting at clubs like uh, the Homebrew Computer Club, uh, to, just so that they could have a computer in their own home. They started the personal computer revolution. Um, that kind of brings us to where we're at today, where I'm reading notes off a cell phone and showing slides off of a projector. Uh, if you look at today, you find people in the same types of you know space spaces, groups of tinkers, hacking around with personal fabrication devices like 3D printers and CNC machines. So 20 years from now, I'm not too sure where we're going to be, but we uh, we have some some guesses, and uh, our next two speakers are going to talk a little bit more about that. So um, uh, I'd like to introduce Rob Geisbert, who's going to talk to us about 3D printing, kind of now and in the future. Um, and I'm Rob Geisbert, and I'm going to talk about uh, what I call desktop 3D printing. Um, and uh, uh, as you see here, we have you know two, three, and then over there four uh, desktop size 3D printers. But these are obviously you know kit built, homemade uh, devices. Um, but uh, you know we. Uh, We've kind of been here before. Um, when the Macintosh came out in the early 80s, uh, PageMaker followed it not too long afterwards, and then, most importantly, the laser printer and PostScript. And suddenly, everybody was a publisher, and everybody could lay out something um, without having to cut pieces of paper and glue it down. Um, they were suddenly able to digitally um, lay out artwork and, and, and make their own publications. And, you know, professional page layout for everyone. And we saw a revolution in not only for, um, not only was it a revolution for uh, the consumer who is empowered, but it was also a revolution for professional publishers, uh, suddenly able to, with much less effort, publish and, and produce, um, whereas before it, it required a lot more expense. Um, and uh, the downside is that uh, every church or school bulletin had more fonts or words ever since. Uh, more fonts than words. Um, today on desktop uh, 3D printing, we are currently, uh, uh, we have the RipRap project, as you see. There's, there's one that's homemade, and here's one that's more, uh, more standard. Um, the, the beauty of this here device is that it was printed using another printer. Um, and um, the one that, that you can download the designs for now is generation, generationally quite a bit different. Um, and the beauty of that is that it evolves. Each one, this, and this is about the, what, fifth or sixth generation, would you say? Um, it's, it's, it's modified every time they make a new copy they modify the design, and then at some point they freeze it and publish the, the artwork. Kind of. And currently, actually, it's it's so open source that you can download a copy of it, make modifications, and then push it back, almost like a social network. Um, and as Justin mentioned, the Arduino. Um, yeah, it's going around, and, and here's a shield for an Arduino, and. Um, there's, there's various different Arduinos. Yeah, there's the Arduino there, a couple of them. Um, that's actually what powers these devices at this point. Um, it's it's a uh, empowering device by quite a bit. Uh, and actually, if you see here, this is the original 
motherboard for the riprap. It doesn't look anything like an Arduino. That's because the Arduino was completely open source and they were able to download and make modifications to it. But it's still an Arduino. It's same software, uh, same main programming. Um, lost my clicker. Um, now, cost wise, what, what do one of these things run? Um, turn out all your own parts. You can generally make one of these, I'm going to say, between five and $700. Mm -hmm. One of these, if you buy one of the kits, you're looking at somewhere probably nearing 1000 yeah. to like $1,241. Yeah, that was, yeah. Right. Yeah, between anywhere between uh, you can go as low as 500 if you want, you know, the, a lot of tuning and a lot of hand holding, um, all the way up to you can go to 2,000 dollars and have one have one pre-made. Yeah, there's there's your there's your completely handmade, uh, yeah, you know, so. woodcut uh, version over there that you know, I'm sure he saved a lot of money, but he didn't save a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, depends on how how much work you want to put into it. Exactly. I'm sure it was more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Far cry from the uh, starting at twenty thousand dollars up to yeah. ten million dollar units that you can right. that you can get. Of course, you know we don't have support material at this point. We can't uh, print objects like I have that example part there. Get um, my slide here. On this and this part I printed last night. Um, you can see where the top of the circle it, the loops kind of fell a little bit. And here's a, a part where we call a bridge where it just completely goes above nothing. There was nothing supporting that in the air. So a couple of the lines drooped. Uh, on a professional uh, on a professional 3D printer, you would have support material. I expect within the next six months, support material will be standard. Um, that's one of the things I'm helping to push push into the firmware and into the, into the hardware end. Yeah, I'm the developer on, on the, both the firmware, the controlling software, and the boards themselves. Yeah. So he yeah. knows the stuff. Um, so the support material, when you describe that, Oh, is yeah. it a Actually, different kind of plastic, or it's it's just a uh, different design? Um, in in the version that we're looking at, there's a special type of plastic, uh, PVA, which I don't recall exactly what that stands for. Polyvinyl acetone, or something like that. Alcohol, something like that. Uh, it's it's a very interesting plastic. It looks mostly like the plastic we have here. You can some you can roll uh, hand one of these uh, hand this out. It's ABS. Yeah. That's ABS. That's what Legos are made out of. It's similar in feel and such, but it's actually, if you drop it in water, it dissolves. It goes away. Which is great because it's also, like these, a thermoplastic, where we heat it, melt it down into a tube, you know, and, and uh, push it through to, to form an object. It works the same way, except for after it's cooled, um, you can drop it in water and it dissolves, dissolves away. So if you print it alongside the ABS, or the other one, this, is, this here is a PLA, which is a cornstarch-based plastic. Um, you can print them next to each other. Yeah. You can print them next to each other and uh, use the PVA to hold structures in place as a, as a bed to print onto. And then when you're done, you just dissolve it. The beauty of that is you could print a completely functional, for example, a clock or some other functional mechanics. Um, uh, as long as there's enough gap in there that the, the two parts won't fuse, um, you could print gears that, that, that mesh together and everything um, that are held apart from each other with the dissolvable material. Once the material is dissolved, then you have a fully functional device that, uh, that's printed, it's made in one piece all together. So you don't even have to be able to open it up and get to the innards. It was it was formed layer by layer, fully functional. As long as there as long as water can get in and wash out the support material. Um, and then we come to MakerBot. Uh, MakerBot is directly related to the RipRap project because um, uh, Zach Hoken, the guy you see in the middle there, um, was actually part of the RipRap project, and he was sitting down with, with Bree Pettis on the right there, um, making a RipRap, and they got to talking. They're sitting in a hackerspace in 2009, and they decide to make a kit. Um, and much closer to this one. Much closer to this one. This one's a custom cut acrylic, but otherwise the same design as the original cupcake. That's the original MakerBot. Um, and there you see their latest generation on the right that's actually printing right now. Um, and they, the seven thousand or seventy-five thousand dollars worth of seed funding from basically 
from, from basically it's family and the, the founder of the Riprap project himself, yeah. actually. Yeah, uh, from a few friends. Uh, yeah, um, they they made a kit and started selling it. Um, they sold over thirty five hundred of them now, and just this year they received ten million dollars worth of funding. So uh, there's definitely belief that this is going to go up and up. Um, and here's, here's the real kicker for, for all the 3D printing is Thingiverse. Anybody who is capable of doing 3D design, uh, particularly industrial designers or people who are really good at it, um, can drive this by providing 3D objects and uploading them to Thingiverse for other people to freely download and modify and print. Uh, just like desktop publishing, not everybody can lay out of uh, uh, anything, for that matter. Uh, 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 so, uh, not everybody can design a 3D object, even with full access to the software, which is, you know, uh, there's open source software and there's extremely expensive software, just like page layout. Um, so, to give you a, a brief example of this, I, I have, um, I don't have it out here, but I have, uh, I saw early on an example of uh, an object that was uploaded, it was a, a toothpaste tube squeezer. And it was uploaded, but the person who uploaded it didn't have a MakerBot. And then somewhere else in the world, uh, I believe the person was in Australia, and somebody else in a completely different continent had a MakerBot, downloaded the object within an hour, and printed it. And it takes about an hour to print. And then suddenly, they have one, they've tried it on a toothpaste tube, and they say, it doesn't quite work right. And so they you know, sent a message through Thingiverse back to the original author, and the person modified it. They printed out, a, the, the person on the other continent printed out another one, and it, it, it worked. And so uh, I, I have one here, I printed one out uh, two years later. Um, so I didn't actually get to play with that, you know, interact in that interaction, but it was uh, still fun to watch. Um, so but the CAD files that everybody's hmm? uploaded? Well, not just, not just CAD files, but yeah, it's, uh, they could be, uh, for example, the outlines for, cut, for laser cutting these bots are on Thingiverse. Uh, Thingiverse is owned and operated by MakerBot, by the way. But it doesn't necessarily have to have anything to do with MakerBots. Um, the riprap designs are all on there, too. Um, they'll and it's the native file. They'll post the native files yeah. and STL files of what these machines operate on. So I'm selling an upgrade for the original MakerBot motherboard that, that plugs into it. Um, and here's the boards. I have all my designs and everything on Thingiverse. I uploaded them to Thingiverse. Uh, yeah, this is my test rig for it, um, if anyone wants to see that. Um, but I uploaded to Thingiverse thinking not that many people would be interested, but I wanted my old motherboard to work like the new ones do. Um, and I uploaded to Thingiverse, and I never said anything to anyone else. That's all I did was I uploaded it. But it tweets out when you upload things, stuff like that. Um, with, and I put on, uh, on the instructions on how to build it. If you're interested in the file, uh, in the um, parts, I have some, you know, I'll sell them for 25 bucks. Within a few hours, I had 15 people that had emailed me saying, yeah, I'll buy one. And then within a week, MakerBot actually asked me and they said, I'll work, can we have 100 of them to sell in our store? Because this is a great upgrade for old bots. And I mean, it, it, it just, it's, gone berserk on me, and all I did was upload it to Thingiverse, the people that, that watch it, watch it closely, and they saw things come in, and then there's, there's a whole ecosystem around it of, of uh, Google Groups and everything else that, that really, really push this whole thing, but Thingiverse is sort of the glue that binds this all together. Um, again, I forgot my clicker. So, what you really want to hear, where do I see this being in 10 years? Um, well, where was the, where is the laser printer now in 10 years? You can go to Office Depot, pick one up. You can, you can go, you can send your files over the internet to Walgreens and they will print you out photographs, posters, whatever you want. You can send the files anywhere and you'll get a print. Full color, almost as good as a printing house. Almost as good as a printer. A real printer. Um, I don't see any reason why that won't be the case with a full 3D object. You upload a file or you take in an SD card, you take it to the back, you hand it to somebody, you pay your money, and an hour later a 
of shopping somewhere else, you come back and there's your, you know, model V8 engine or whatever, you know, in full color. Uh, it's it's definitely going to it's going to revolutionize solid objects the same way that 2D printers and PostScript and you know the Macintosh uh, revolutionized 2D printing. And to talk more about the future of it, we have Craig. Hi, I'm Craig Bershite, uh, involved in the hack space with these guys. I'm going to just kind of talk about some interesting things that are going on now with 3D printing and its applications and um, kind of speculate on where things are going. Uh, so the idea that these 3D printers are going to be in homes uh, and going to be in widespread use isn't particularly far-fetched. This is the Origo. It's a product in development right now, targeted at kids. It's got an $800 price point. At least the developers think they can uh, hit that $800 price point. And this could be the new Easy Bake Oven. Uh, kids design stuff. They click print on a printer, and toys come out of it. It's a magic box. Um, once we have these 3D printers, there's going to be a market for easy uh, to use 3D modeling software. Right now, the stuff that's out there as far as the commercial stuff, it's, it's good. It's got kind of a learning curve, and it's expensive. Uh, this is 3D10. This is actually the software that they're proposing to use with the Origo. It's a web-based, this is just a screenshot I pulled off of uh, the website. Um, and I place some blocks around there. Uh, this is a web-based, easy-to-use uh, WebGL interface that's like using Legos to build objects. Uh, it's targeted as something really easy for kids to do. Um, you can save your model directly from here. There's a lot of stuff on Thingiverse posted from 3D10. Um, and here's the website. Uh, you can go there and just check it out. Um, it's a really cool web interface. Uh, another really easy to use uh, web-based uh, CAD tool is Tinkercad. Uh, it's got some really interesting tutorials you can get through in about, called missions, you can get through in about 15 minutes. And you can be making 3D objects in your web browser and downloading them or posting them uh, onto Thingiverse. Uh, in one of the ways of monetizing this is there's a button in some of these softwares to order the object you just created, but you can also send it to your 3D printer once you have them moving in your house. Um, what it'll also open up for is uh, what 3D printers in the home will also open up uh, is 3D online marketplaces, not necessarily like Thingiverse, but more like iTunes, where you can get professionally made. 3D models, or people can share and sell 3D models uh, uh, for your uh, 3D printer, because not everyone's going to be a designer. Not everyone's going to design everything they build. Um, this is another interesting device. This is, uh, there was a press release from Roland uh, for this on October 5th. This is a small desktop mill. This thing is tiny. You could actually toss it into a messenger bag or a backpack. And uh, and uh, it, it's targeted at about $1,000. Uh, this is something that, that they released in, in Japan. Um, and you can use it to uh, mill out of foam board, uh, balsa wood, and plastic, uh, you know, trinkets and stuff like this. Same, same type of thing, small items, toys, earrings, um, that kind of thing. Um, and this device has a, an online marketplace type component where you can get uh, models made by other people that are doing this, professionally made models, that kind of thing. So online marketplaces where you can download the newest iPhone case, that kind of thing, uh, uh, print it out at your home, and instantly have your thing. You, not, you don't have to wait for it to come in the mail or go to the store or whatever. Um, is one of those things that I think we're going to be seeing in the next couple of years. Um, 
also when everyone has a free 3D printer, um, we might see free or cheap, just like uh, uh, the online uh, marketplace components, we might see free or cheap downloadable content for toys and stuff like that. You might go get a Hot Wheels set and it have some interchangeable bodies for the cars and you could either design or allow kids to design their own or download new models licensed by uh, uh, Hot Wheels and print them out and then snap them on your car and use them in your set. You could buy IKEA furniture for your uh, Barbie dream house. Um, interesting stuff like that. Uh, uh, you could download models for Pokemon uh, and print out your own toys. Uh, so there might be some other marketing kind of tie-in components for this. Um, when kids have access to 3D printers or people have access to 3D printers in their homes. Um, now the next section I'm going to talk about is uh, kind of some of the impacts of the DIY 3D printers uh, and also kind of where commercial 3D printing is going. It's going to be a hard sell to uh, uh, keep building a $20,000 uh, plastic deposition machine when you can buy a $2,000 box that does pretty much the same thing, especially when, when we get support material and everything like that. So I kind of see uh, professional 3D printing getting a little bit cheaper as time goes on, and as it becomes more prevalent. Um, when professional industrial 3D printing gets cheaper, I, I think we're going to be seeing more online make marketplaces with completely completed good. Um, you can go to a site and download the newest cool design from your favorite designer uh, for your iPad case. Um, this is actually a marketplace, uh, a, a, a screenshot of the marketplace on Shapeways. Um, here are some of the items that are, Shapeways is a provider of a 3D printing service and they provide a lot of interesting plastics, metal, ceramics, uh, and from industrial 3D printers you can upload a 3D model and purchase that uh, object in a variety of interesting materials. They also have an online marketplace component where designers can post stuff and uh, for instance, uh, here's a, a, a ring uh, in uh, probably sterling silver um, with a, a message embossed on the inside. You can buy that ring. You can get the designer to size it to your particular ring size. You can get a custom message inside the ring. Um, that costs, in silver, 34 bucks. Um, here's a, an, an octo cup. It's a mug with eight handles. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of jewelry and other interesting designs. Um, uh, there's a lens cap holder. It's uh, on the camera strap. There's actually a, a spot where you can take your lens cap off and snap it on to the strap. Uh, these are all things people have designed, put up for sale um, on Shapeways, and when you order it, then you can even customize it. It'll get printed and sent to you. Um, I see this getting more and more popular. There's more than one. There's three big uh, uh, providers of uh, online uh, 3D printing and other services out there right now. Shapeways is one of them. Uh, Pinoco and iMaterialize. Um, and I, I see more and more people making stuff like this. If you, if you were going to make that <clears throat> lime green part, mm -hmm. what's your what's your investment in the, the plastics there? Uh, How many ounces is that? Like pennies, my, yeah, pennies, dollars, that's pennies, pennies. 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 Um, a, a, a big, a, a big quote that they had from MakerBot was, "Our machines cost an order of magnitude cheap, or an order of magnitude less to build, and an order of magnitude less to operate." So the same object through Shapeways would be what seventy-five bucks. Possibly, uh, they're pretty. It depends on the material used, but as, uh, as light as this is, probably as low as twenty-five bucks. But on on the MakerBot, that's probably. Maybe five cents on the high. Uh, <coughs> this, uh, to give you an idea, the, the plastic for this stuff, uh, depending on which manufacturer you get through, you, uh, ten dollars a pound isn't necessarily a uh, is, is is a decent price. Um, they get maybe up to twenty dollars a pound, depending on the plastics you get. So think about how much that weighs uh, and how many parts you can get out of a pound of plastic. Uh, so. Yeah, all the stuff on that table, 
probably cost less than $10 uh, to produce. Is there any plastic that's not quite so hard that's more flexible? They actually have flexible PLA. It's a recent product. We have not played with it, but you can actually make cups and things like that that are flexible. When they're done, you can squish Yeah, you can squish them. Now, this, you can make this. This does have a flex, but this is built with a structure in it that makes it strong. But you can make this have a flex, but to a certain extent, there is an example part like, like this one here actually um, this one here actually has a bit of a spring to it, just from the natural springiness of the cup. So I'm thinking of like the silicone, silicone baking cup thing, like that. Kind yeah, of yeah, that's, yeah, that's that's kind that's of the, the texture of the, the. Yeah, very flexible PLA. Yeah. And they printed out. A, yeah, the example that they showed was they printed out a cup. It's still something that's in development. Right yeah. Now. Some people have actually printed out in silicone as well. Um, it's one of the things that's uh, uh, kind of in development. Not many people do it. Most people use PLA or uh, uh, ABS. But yeah, there is flexible material. There's different types of plastic you can use. Um, hey, Greg, yeah. What is it? Talk about the uh, torso racer. Um, yeah. Oh, if anyone didn't see this. Yeah, if anyone didn't see this, this I was a. I'm looking at the gearbox on the inside. It's yeah. kind of interesting. This is a part that was designed by one of our members here in Kansas City. He was a former architect, and uh, he made amazing models. He's not a tech guy. Um, he just knew how to use tools really well. He got made all this stuff in SketchUp, the free version of SketchUp. Uh, but you know, he made amazing models. There's a lot of stuff out there on Thingiverse that uh, uh, that he's got. He's got uh, some architectural models for Gothic Cathedral playset. There's a whole bunch of individual models you can make your own Gothic Cathedral out of. Um, this is printed off on one of these regular MakerBots, a cupcake actually, because he's got the oldest original uh, uh, MakerBot, basically. Um, it's printed out in several parts in a couple of different colors of plastic. Uh, pretty much everything except for the tires on the new ones uh, are printed out on a MakerBot, including the gearbox. Normally um, that's all. You take kind of remote control car tires and some motors and a servo on the inside, and you can remote control these and race them around. At Maker Fair in New York, there's a whole racetrack that our friend designed for racing these things. Kids loved it. Yeah, and it's if it, you don't get the reference, this is from uh, Mario Kart. Um, but isn't there a rumor? Maybe Louise could talk about. Isn't there a rumor that Maker Bots would be selling a kit like this? Yeah, so I mean, so what they want to do is sell. All, all we really bought was you know, a twelve dollar RC component from yeah, we, we uh, they, the king. Yeah, and they they bought an RC radio set, uh, just like you'd use in a regular RC car, and a off the shelf toy car that was relatively cheap. The component cost, other than the shell itself, is probably forty dollars, fifty dollars. So um, what Maker might do is release a kit, but it's just the hardware and electronics. You actually provide the shells. Because mm -hmm. every turtle racer owner printer has customized it somehow. Yeah. Color, you got yeah. Really, really love it. There's a so it's yeah. like that you're buying a remote control car that you have to fill because you happen to have one of these at home. That's a large build though. It, it's a it's it hours a piece and um, Yeah. It's and like I said, most of those shells are completely different. People make them in different colors. People make them clear and put RGB LED clusters inside, so it flashes all these different colors. People put stuff on the spikes. There's a couple of modules for wings for it, um, and a couple of other random uh, things. Willy bars is another addition, so it doesn't fall over backwards when you gun it. Um, <laughs> what about what about maintenance? I mean, these, these gears will wear over time. How often are you? So the, about the, after the first day of racing at Maker Fair New York, uh, you know, kids ran these, so basically they would hit a wall and then hold it. Yeah. So they burnt up every single spur gear. Well, they had 18 Maker Bots. They just ran out of time. Yeah. The spur gear on that probably takes minutes. under 10 minutes to make one. If, yeah, and then you've seen on these bots, a lot of people also print out um, improved copies and or just spares for their bots. Um, How long does it take for it to wear out? That's why I say about 100, 100, 200. But anyway, MakerBot's about seeing maybe they have a, a, a kit module here where, you know, there's a really awesome design that someone's put up, but you as a person don't really want to go to McMaster Car and buy all the parts or how we turn it or whatever. You just pick up your package, download your product, print it, customize it, do whatever you want to do.
just said, yeah. <laughs> so you know what I was saying is MakerBot's looking at a model that you know may look like I'll sell you the hardware and the kit, you know, or the uh, components that support this 3D model. You know, you download it, customize it to your own. You know, right now we don't really have that. You go to Walmart, pick a red, blue, or green one. It does what it does, or you pay more. In this scenario, there's people that have taken that as a platform and made it. Uh, they want to make it autonomous. They've made tank treads. They've built on his gearbox, and just just visit Thingiverse, and you'll you'll see an object, and then you'll see derivatives that. Um, if you look up Turtle Shell Racer, you'll see those. It's collaborative design. That's yeah, there, there's, there's, there's designs out there, like you said, tank treads. There's mechanic wheels, which are these weird looking wheels that allow you to move perpendicular to the uh, uh, axis of rotation for the wheels. The wheel with wheels on it. Yeah, it's a wheel with wheels. It's a wheel inside of a wheel. Yeah. Um, but uh, that, that the model that uh, Luis was talking about is what a lot of open source hardware uh, uh, uses we release the software, we release all the plans for this, uh, allow people to make derivatives, allow people to make them and actually make money off of them. We sell them or we, we sell completed products and kits so people don't have to go to five different suppliers to get all the materials or buy a hundred something when they need four. Um, and that's the economic model that's kind of behind all this open source stuff. Um, Back on the topic. Um, um, cheap industrial 3D printers might allow uh, more companies other than the specialized Shapeways or other manufacturers that are just marketing uh, 3D printing to individuals. Uh, you might be able to, uh, for instance, go online to Hallmark's website and customize a keepsake ornament with your family um, and get it printed out and delivered to your, ha to your home for that year. Um, or any other kind of uh, uh, other products. Uh, uh, just like Apple allows you to uh, get laser engraved uh, iPods, you might be able to further customize individual products. Um, um, another thing that comes along with this is this is Pinoco. Pinoco offers 3D printing, but they didn't start out with 3D printing. They uh, first offered laser cutting, and I have some stuff here that's laser cut, like this entire bot is laser cut. The cases on these are bot, uh, are, are laser cut. Um, uh, and uh, uh, they went on to, after being successful with laser cutting, uh, offer 3D printing, some different 3D printing than some of the providers online. And very recently, they uh, offered uh, CNC milling application. So you can see, oh, they also partnered with uh, a, 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 an electronics supplier that, that specializes in open design as well, um, or at least fosters open design as well. So you can get the electronics, this box, and all the components it comes with, this shape table, this chair, um, 3D printed parts like we've said here. All of this can be ordered online through an automated ordering system. Uh, with Pinoco, and they call it personal factory. Today. Today. That's today. Yeah, that's today. Um, uh, this allows uh, people like uh, MakerBot and individuals that are going to make a product that's going to say maybe sell less than a thousand to get professional looking cases and professionally made PCBs and things like that uh, uh, to get to market without having to go to China or go to a local provider, get tooling, make plastic cases and things like that. So if you're going to make a small run of stuff, um, or if you're just going to make prototypes really quickly, this stuff is available to individuals. I could see uh, companies quite easily adapting this to existing stuff. Where if you have a market that's going to sell 2,000 units a year, you might actually go to market without any like mass production capabilities. You might actually just order 200 cases when you need them, um, or 200 fully completed PCBs, um, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, this comes to the last point I'm going to make here is on-demand manufacturing. Uh, 
this is something that I've run into. Like uh, this acrylic case is something that I offer um, for people with MakerBots that uh, want to add a little bit of bling um, uh, to their designs. Um, they, are, they look really nice. Um, they're a little bit more rigid than wood. Um, but I sell this product. I do not have any of those in stock. Someone orders that product. I literally load up on my laptop the digital designs that create that, put a sheet of plastic into a laser cutter, and a couple hours later, I can put it in a box and ship it. Um, we might see some uh, uh, of this going to actual manufacturing. When you order an iPhone case, you might get the iPhone case that they have on the shelves, but they might have six. Um, as soon as you start ordering iPhone cases, they might go print out a few more. Um, so uh, seeing this manufacturing where you have a few feedstock materials and then you use that to make whatever people are buying right now uh, uh, could potentially be something that we see more and more of in the future. Uh, people are already starting to do that. And I'm done. So you mentioned you mentioned that talking about uh, uh, flexible materials. Something we didn't mention, and we I, I think we talked about mentioning early on, is there's medical applications to this. You can print in materials. Oh, you can you can print in materials that are uh, um, basically uh, sugar, uh, similar to the PLA that we have there, that um, will be uh, absorbed and used by by biological material. And that's what they're using now to print prosthetic um, prosthetics, but they're also using it to print uh, organs. Like uh, right now, they're primarily uh, uh, like ears and noses. Stuff that's not functional, but cosmetic. Um, replacing the cartilage, for example, stuff like that. Um, where it's printed into the right shape, and then they use you know cells from your body so that it's guaranteed to work. They will use that as a lattice, as a... Uh, a structure, fill in that shape, and then continue to grow from there uh, as that shape. And it's it, it's a field that's developing very rapidly, but it's it's one of the many aspects that 3D printing is, is being used for, not just for making objects for household use, but it's also, uh, for example, it could be used for tools in a factory. You can print out a tool if your tool breaks, that sort of thing. Um, and it's not just you print it in plastic. You can print this in plastic and then cast this into metal. There are various post-processing uh, options as well. Um, things that we didn't really touch on, but um, very many further aspects outside of just household use, um, as you see here. You've talked about this going through several generations. Mm -hmm. And what is the improvement between the generations that you're seeing? Um, Generationally speaking, well, first of all, uh, uh, there's the, the beginning. Huh? I mean, you start at the very beginning. Yeah. Here, go ahead. When the MakerBot first came out, we were printing on uh, little foam boards and uh, uh, with rafts, which are these uh, structures they put underneath the actual objects. Um, professional printers use those. Yeah, professional printers still use those. Um, through that, it was really hard. The first five minute or the first two or three minutes of a print were make or break time. You might start something five times and get through one of them, and then you get halfway through and it falls off the build platform. Um, that kind of thing. Um, uh, uh, people have worked on getting the software better for generating better tool paths. Um, people have worked on getting, oh yeah, the extruders. Um, if you got a clog in your original extruder um, and the motor continued applying pressure, your uh, uh, print head would literally eject um, from the plastic block it was using to I insulate. Think we've all done it. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Um, also, yeah. Also, everyone that originally had these uh, has crashed the head into the build platform at one point or another. Now um, the platforms are metal. But now the time, they were they were actually plastic. Or so if you drove it in, it just kept right on going yeah. and melted a hole right through. Yep. So um, it, was, it was a pretty big thing. First thing I did when I got my, got it all put together, first thing I did was drive right through and melt yeah. the hole and I had to, I immediately couldn't print because I had a hole in the middle of my platform. Yeah. Fast forward to today, we put together a print head and it works. Not only does it work, it doesn't clog, it doesn't uh, uh, form 
globs of plastic. It doesn't break down rapidly over time. The first um, print off of my latest print head, which is what I have on there now, um, looked like this. I mean, it was this quality. Um, we've improved the software and the hardware to be massively more reliable and more accurate. Yeah. Our build platforms have been improved drastically. You'll see that on most of these bots, they actually have a heated build platform. That keeps the, the plastic will actually shrink as it cools and pull up from whatever substrate it was on. Um, that caused a whole lot of problems in printing. There's you know, original prints often had bowl shaped or on one edge had a bowl shaped edge. Um, the heated build platform uh, uh, allows you to print directly to the platform, no wrapped, um, print faster, and to print without the parts getting ripped up. So a brief when, explanation of that is this type of plastic when it's heated, it's expanded. When it shrink, when it cools, it shrinks. So whatever it's adhered to, whenever it shrinks, it will. Whenever, whenever it's, whenever it's heat, whenever it cools, it shrinks. So it'll pop itself up off of whatever it's attached to. So you'll get halfway through. Oh, you get a quarter of an inch up off the bottom of this print. It was printed in this orientation, and it would just pop off. And so you come back in and look at your printer, and it's dragging a part around with this big blob at the end of the nozzle. Um, or more often than that, it's actually shot it off onto the side of the bot, and you've got this noodly uh, mess that looks this like a This is an amateur poodle. hobby right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Things go wrong. That's why my printer actually isn't printing for you today. So yeah, yeah. That's and why I need to print out parts for me. It, I, from those early beginnings, most of the time, we print, and a good-looking part comes out. Like, these parts right here, they're not multiple prints or anything like that. This is what they came off with the first time we tried. No tune. Yeah. Um, and it used to be you have to tune quite a bit on your individual bots when you got the kit you put for together. Part. For each part. Yeah. For each type of model you had to tune differently. Yeah. Um, that is largely going away. Um, there's still a little bit of tuning that can be done, but for the most part, you click print, something nice comes out if you've got the basic stuff done right. Um, so in the last two years, the uh, uh, print quality and hardware that go with it has definitely improved quite a bit. The rep rep models have improved quite a bit as well. They have newer models that require fewer parts and require fewer complex parts. Um, they have uh, uh, rep rep models now that can print out uh, models that look like they came from a commercial system that are operating on metal rods and felt washers um, that you can get at a hardware store. How long did that take you to print? This one took about 50 hours worth of uh, parts printing to get this thing printed out. The newer versions of the riprap, such as this lime green thing over here, that's that's kind of the up brace of the, the newer riprap. I think you can print one of these out in what, 12 hours? About it's 12 hours, five plates on a MakerBot. One plate, yeah, I have one of these. 26 plates on a MakerBot, so 26 full yeah. prints of this. Now that's it's five. That's five. So. And if you have one of these already, then it's a single plate because it has a much larger build yeah. platform. And so it can print one in eight hours. Yeah, so it's. You can print a copy of itself in eight hours. Things are getting better, and they're getting better really quickly because of the, the collaborative design. Um, we're starting to run out of time, I think. Uh, and we wanted to open up for so, a few more questions, if anyone had any. But I also wanted to pitch, um, before, before while we still have a captive audience here, uh, as we've said at the beginning, we were part of the hackerspace, the Cowtown Computer Congress hackerspace. You can find us at c3kc.org. Um, every Thursday night, so tonight, if you have, if you have it open, we have our, our public meetings. Uh, at 7 p.m., we are we have a location out on out in Brookside. You can find us in 63rd. Um, lo look up our location. There. It's four, but it's on the East 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 or 440 yeah. 63rd Street. 440 63rd Street. It's yeah. a big building with kind of a fence around it, and oh, there might right. be a zombie outside because I think Dave might have finished this project. It was, yeah, <laughs> he was definitely shambling. <laughs> we we have all sorts of crazy stuff going on there, but if anyone's interested, they can come by for that. Also, I, I can't stress any more. Maker Fair down at Union Station, June 23rd and 24th, uh, just down the street from here. As you know, if you were there last June, you know how great of a time it was. If you haven't been there yet, I strongly recommend you go. It's so much more than just our hackers. It's way more than just us. We are, yeah, we occupy a very small booth. Yes, you will see lots of cool we had, things. We had people there from all over the world. Yep, yep. Um, it's. I think it's going to be bigger this year than it was, or bigger next year than it was this year, so. Oh yeah, when you go, 3D Printer Village. 3D Printer Village. We'll, yes. we'll, be all, we'll all be there. We'll print you out stuff. Um, now, does anyone have any questions while we still have time before you guys have to go over and watch your movie? Anyone have a...
Yes. But when we say print itself, what it does is it prints most of the um, the hard to main or hard to obtain parts. Okay. So most of the parts on here, in fact, basically all, all except the electronics right here and and the the motors, are things that you can buy at the local hardware store. Um, kind of true. This this unit uses all metric, and we cannot find threaded rod in metric sizes at, at American hardware stores. It's an international project, mind you, so that's where all the, the specifications are. Yeah. The goal of the RevRep project is to make everything, if they can, on this. Um, there's also there's there's also um, projects out there that there's a SAE version of this um, where you can get all your mecha mechanical parts. People have made transistors on this. Yes. Like literally, they've made the, transistors. Yeah, they printed transistors LEDs. on this. I saw one where they printed LEDs. Um, people have printed out the metal <laughs> traces for an end stop on this. So people are using this machine in order to make things like oh, printed circuit boards. You can make the you can make the circuit boards for it on it as well with different tool heads. Well, um, like the, the goal of this machine is to make all of the parts on that machine. There's a prize out if you can. Yeah, yeah, the there, there's a prize out there called the Gata Prize. Gata, I think that's how it's pronounced. Gata Prize. It's similar to the X Prize for space flight. You know, for private space flight. It's basically saying if you can come up with a, a rapid prototyper that can make like 75% of its own parts <coughs> and print out in two different materials. One of them conductive, so therefore you can actually print circuit boards. Uh, and there's a few other specifications. If you can do this, you win, what is that, like $2 million or something like that? Yeah. It's, it's okay. so, yeah. so there's... Well, there's, there's two levels of prices. Yeah. Um, but the, the goal of it isn't just industrial household stuff, honestly. Honestly, the goal of it is, 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 is much more noble than that. It's actually to help third world countries and uh, non-industrialized countries kind of help dig themselves out of the hole. Because if you think of it, this, this thing, particularly at the levels that they've, they've specified their goals, um, so that uh, with one of those functioning, you have a small industry, you have a small factory on a desktop. I think that's our wrap it up sign. Yeah, that's our wrap it up. Um, <laughs> Beeps and being like but, this usually mean that sort of thing. But yeah, but we'll, we'll be up here if you have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.